Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, my name is Devin Hornfett. I'm an environmental engineer at PE. Um, I've been working with Idorado and Newmont for the last almost 10 years, doing a lot of the monitoring and um, just helping them out with all of their regulatory compliance issues. Um, we're going to start by talking about the consent decree, and I'm mostly going to be discussing the Red Mountain side of the activities as opposed to the Telluride side. And that might be a little bit where that $140 million discrepancy comes from. There was a solid chunk spent over on the Red Mountain side, the high country, and uh, the Telluride tailings down valley as well. So that 140 is probably more of the entire picture. Um, what the goal was in the early 90s when the when the consent decree uh, was signed was to achieve a 50% reduction in zinc concentrations in Red Mountain Creek. And that was largely based around what we considered to be the mining activity induced zinc and the natural uh, zinc that is, and just all the metals, as mine drainage, um, rock drainage, that is coming from the highly mineralized zones of the Red Mountain Caldera, super sulfitic uh, mineralized area. Um, and so the initial efforts for that 50% reduction were really focused on source controls, which Mark was really speaking to, diversion ditches to take the mine drainages and route them around existing waste rock piles. Uh, the consolidation of disparate tailings piles into single individual piles where the water infiltration could be better controlled um, and seeded, vegetated, get a little help from evapotranspiration from your plants and things on top of your tailings pile, keeping water from moving through because that's where the, the real mobility happens for your metals. Um, however, it, we didn't managed to achieve that 50% zinc reduction. And so we've started taking a look at other opportunities for removing zinc from the Red Mountain Creek system. Um, the contingency plan outlined that after so many years, if we couldn't achieve compliance, we would start performing additional characterizations of the um, zinc loading sources, which we was a process we started there in 2012, and since then we've been evaluating possible remedial measures for removing zinc from the stream system. Um, let's start at the beginning though, and where, why, how, acid mine drainage. They say you're not supposed to make your PowerPoint slides too busy, but I kind of like it because it really conveys the chaos a little bit of what exactly is happening inside our mountains over on the Red Mountain side. So what we have in the beginning is the uh, dissolution of pyrite, iron sulfide. And with a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of water, we see that break down into Fe2, ferrous iron, and uh, sulfuric acid <laughs> dissociated there. Um, and then what happens inside our mountains, we get um, Fe2 forming Fe3, ferric iron. The ferric iron will react with the pyrite additionally, more water producing more ferrous iron. And for all of you um, who've maybe a little departed from chemistry, every time you see an H, that is acidity, uh, our pH, our negative log of the hydrogen ions. So here we go, our uh, acid's kind of forming in this crazy negative feedback loop. As the ferrous produces more ferric, the ferric produces more ferrous, and we end up in this kind of downward spiral. Um, and then we head into the, uh, the next phase where those ferric and ferrous ions actually have the opportunity to... <laughs> to dissolve the rest of our metal sulfides located in our mineralized veins. So everything from pyrite to pyrotite to cal cal chalcopyrite. We've got sphalerite. There's also ferriferous sphalerite. Um, it's basically a, a mineralized war zone underneath our mountains over in Red Mountain. And you'll see oxygen certainly oxidizes some of our metals, but we don't really need oxygen once we get this ferric iron into the system. And the ferric iron itself will begin to oxidize our metals. This is the one that we're really concerned about, zinc being our compliance 
uh, metal for the consent decree. Um, so you'll see the ferric iron can actually start to oxidize our zinc sulfides, producing dissolved zinc, more ferrous iron to produce more ferric iron, and uh, sulfate and acidity at the back side. But on some level, and this is still simple, this is, this is nothing compared to what's actually happening in our mine pools, um, but it gives you an idea of exactly what's happening. Um, and uh, there's, there's the visual evidence. <laughs> All right. So what can we do? We can prevent it from forming in the first place. We can deal with it once it's already formed. So how would, might we prevent it from forming? Theoretically, we could eliminate all the oxygen from our atmosphere. <laughs> I'm not sure that would be the best idea. We can uh, prevent water from infiltrating entire mountain ranges and feeding hundreds of miles of mine tunnels. I don't know if that's gonna be possible. We could completely drain our mountain ranges and drop our water tables thousands of feet to the point where we destroy the rest of our ecosystems. Also, probably not the best idea. How can we prevent it practically? Well, we can use what we were doing there in the 90s, which is primarily source controls, and uh, just diverting the water away from the sulfide minerals that we see on the surface, and uh, just trying to steer, steer the water away as best we can, um, and consolidating those piles, and really just trying to lock it into a place where we control what's happening a little bit better is, is a big part of that. Or um, one, another big one that a lot of people like or like to talk about is prevent the oxygen interaction with our mine pool waters. Um, there's a dissolved oxygen component, but most literature says that atmospheric oxygen is our primary driver of those acid mine drainages. So what uh, several, several groups um, proposed would be filling our mine tunnels, primarily through bulkheading, and this will limit chimney effects through our mines, which exposes our waters to oxygen, um, and really would give us control points, ideally. Um, but in really massive mine complexes, just understanding all of those uh, tunnels, stopes, what's collapsed, what hasn't, where are we seeing the atmospheric oxygen enter? It's really just um, a huge, huge undertaking that uh, we might be a little cocky to think we can truly understand. Um, and then another preventative measure that a lot of folks have been trying lately here are bactericides because, and I, I did, should have touched on this in the acid uh, mine drainage slide, a lot of uh, the formation is really created through this um, We've got ferrooxidans, thiobacillus, there's bacterial activity catalyzing the conversion from ferrous to ferric, ferric to ferrous, and really accelerating that process far beyond what a natural chemical um, situation might, might <clears throat> promote. So by eliminating those bacteria, we eliminate that catalysis and, uh, and slow down the process. However, once you start talking about these massive mine complexes again, the idea of actually being able to take nature out of the equation um, is really intimidating and pretty much impossible. Bactericides really work well on freshly exposed sulfide materials. So active mines, they'll open a wall up, they'll spray it down, and it'll slow down that process. And that's where they've been pretty successful. But in established mine pools where maybe mining hasn't happened for 50 years and this entire ecology is developed in these mine pools, uh, trying to alter the bacterial chemistry just isn't really a feasible option. Uh, so if we can't necessarily prevent it, what do we do with it if it already exists? Well, uh, active treatment is certainly an option. Um, for the San Juans, and particularly Red Mountain Pass, it really is a difficult proposition. Um, you've got, you require electricity, so a continuous power supply. Um, it would require a centralized collection of water as we pull together various mine portals, portals that are contributing. And so that involves pipelines and easements and bridges across avalanche pathways and rock slides. Um, you would need constant access to the site. Uh, I think many are probably familiar with the slide that happened here in Red Mountain Pass that shut it down for about a couple months here, just this past winter. So the idea that we would 
always need to be able to have access is really just not the most sustainable proposition. You would have haz hazardous materials of your concentrated chemicals coming up uh, the highways and um, delivering weekly to your, your plant. And then, of course, the 20 to $30 million capital expenditure price tag and one to two million a year in perpetuity. So it's just not the most sustainable proposition, um, especially when we compare it to passive treatment. What is passive treatment? Passive treatment is an independently powered system, typically gravity driven. So we aren't relying a lot on electricity. Uh, we can put these systems in at the mouths of our portals instead of trying to centrally locate it. So if maybe if one system goes out, we don't lose treatment of all of our waters at one time. And uh, say if an active treatment plant did happen that we couldn't make it up and we had made all these strides and cleaned the creek up and then you lose your treatment capacity and now your kill happens once you uh, once that goes down. So being able to separate your passive treatment systems to all your different portals really provides redundancy. Um, it utilizes engineering to accelerate the natural processes. So that's all we're really doing, even in the, even in the active treatment world, um, where nature's doing most of this anyway. It just takes it a lot longer um, or further down the reach of a stream where it, the buffering comes in it drops the irons out, and we see it in the bottom of our creeks. Um, so the idea here is to really have that entire process happen in a localized area that will um, allow us to control those metals. It allows us to keep the, the uh, metals isolated from the broader watershed and river system. And ideally, we would uh, be able to create these sustainable passive systems that could last for longer terms, what long means, can mean different things to different people, um, and do it for a cost that we might actually be able to stomach as a society. <clears throat> so what are the challenges to passive treatment, particularly in the San Juans and particularly in the Red Mountain Caldera Zone? Um, well, we've got the exhaustion of whatever you put into the system. If you want to... <clears throat> treat that water for any real length of time, one year, five years, 10 years, um, you really kind of have to load it up with some solid mass to combat the mass. But when you start making your system too big, now you start exposing yourself to the physical plugging as those iron hydroxides, your aluminum precipitates, all start falling out of your system. And so if you put in 25 years worth of media, but your plug happens after the first year right up front, what have you really done? You get a spill or whatever it is and the system stops working. Um, for various systems, this one's kind of funny, lack of dissolved oxygen or excess dissolved oxygen. Uh, different passive systems are gonna require different influent chemistries. Some passive systems need there to be an anoxic system, no oxygen in the water. Sulfate reducing bacteria, SRBs are a big uh, example of that. Um, and other ones, you have the lack of dissolved oxygen. If you're trying to precipitate these metals out at a higher pH, you really need as much oxygen as possible to get those oxides to start to form. Um, San Juan's, obviously, we've got plenty of snow. We get our ice. Um, it gets down to 40 below up there. We're trying to put some of these at 12,000, 13,000 feet. Um, and the heaving just from... Uh, our frost heaving is just can wreak havoc on your concrete construction or whatever the case is. Um, the metal loads and the acidity in the Red Mountain area are really uh, pretty difficult. I was taking a passive mine treatment short course at the International Mine Water Association conference here a few years ago, and uh, Bob Adeen was the, the guy teaching the class, and he said, bring up your mine water chemistry. Um, at, at lunch, and we'll talk about what you might be able to bring into the system, or what might, system might be good for you. And so I penciled it down, and I brought it up, and I showed it to him, and he looked at it, and he said, you're in the wrong class. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I, I, I kind of know that, but I really need to prove you wrong. Um, and it really, that just came down to the sheer metal loads that we see coming out of some of these systems. Um, particularly the ferrous and ferric iron wreaking that havoc down there and uh, unlocking the rest of our metal sulfides. 
Um, and the other thing that makes zinc in particular difficult for classic passive treatment, um, and which would typically use, say, a limestone basin, is that to get zinc oxides to form and precipitate, uh, you really need to be well above a pH of 8.5, ideally closer to 9.5. And, and to get that kind of pH adjustment, especially when you're starting at a pH of, say, 2 or 3, um, you, you need a lot of time, hydraulic retention time spent in your media, and then a lot of immediate limestone, and you can leave it in there as long as you want, and you probably aren't gonna get above a pH of eight if you're lucky. Um, so zinc in particular is a big one. We can get, if we get above the magic number of around five or so, a lot of our iron, most of our iron is gonna fall out. Um, and manganese kinda is another one with the zinc that provides some, some unique challenges. Uh, tied directly into that is our extreme acidity, um, and it's not just the hydrogen acidity. We also have this metals acidity that we have to deal with in our waters, and as, even as we form some of the things we're trying to get to fall out, our iron uh, uh, hydroxides, uh, it's forming acidity again just through that own reaction, and so you really need to be able to power through um, with your buffering capacity and get this stuff to drop. So, to do that, for most passive systems, it requires a serious amount of hydraulic retention time. And given the topography of Red Mountain Pass, um, providing the kinds of basins and the size of basins to get that hydraulic retention time being just the amount of time the water spends inside the system, um, you need to have really large footprints and areas. And a classic aerobic limestone bed, you might like 24 hours of hydraulic retention time if you have 100 gallons per minute coming in. Uh, you can see that adds up pretty quickly to Olympic-sized swimming pools that we're trying to put down steep canyons. Um, so another, that's another real big hurdle is just the footprint of a lot of our passive systems. And then, um, you know, kind of this all or nothing world that uh, Mark was talking to a little bit where we can achieve maybe an 80 or a 90% removal with a lot of our passive techniques, but can we get it down to the truly strict standards provided by the Clean Water Act or some of these other ones? Um, it's, it's just a real challenge with passive treatment in many cases. Um, so what are a couple different kinds? We've got our biological biochemical reactors. So this can be everything from wetlands and our iron fens that are really unique to the San Juan Mountains, um, bioselected uh, <clears throat> sorry, self-selected um, biologies that are really kind of thriving in some of these environments. And that's something that we can learn from a lot. And there's been some great research going on up here for the last 15 years uh, into those, those kinds of systems where nature's really working itself out on its own and it's up to us to learn uh, from nature. Um, also, so part of that also is the sulfate reducing bioreactors, problems there. You need to have an anoxic influent. Really the footprint uh, required is just prohibitive in many cases. And then if you have too low a pH or too acidic of a system, you'll actually kill off your biological activity that's sequestering the metals and doing all the work. And uh, so for, you can just rule it right out for several of our kinds of systems. And then we come to our abiotic reactors. And this is really what we've been focusing on for the last couple of years. Um, and basically what it is is just using reactive media, which could be anything. And it's uh, from limestone to, I'll explain all these in just a second. Um, to force those preferred chemical reactions, bring our buffering, bring our pH up to where we get all our metals to start falling out in places that we've designed and want them to instead of in our creek bottoms. Um, and all of these are kind of designed to solve some of those specific problems um, that I was talking about earlier. Anoxic limestone basins you might use if you have an anoxic chemistry coming in the front. Um, to provide a lot of buffering into your water and not have that iron plug the system until you introduce oxygen later. Um, this is a, these are a whole set of reactive medias and you know, they've all got their own attributes. Appetite is this seashell uh, biological kind of carbonate that really has some interesting potential. Um, 
And that's one we're looking at testing. We haven't really gotten to yet. You've got your activated carbon, very expensive, but absorbs those metals right out of the water. Um, zero valent iron has been a big one that has been tested a lot and kind of has a unique uh, metals range, susceptible to plugging. Um, the one that we are looking at implementing up on Red Mountain Pass this summer is IRM, which is the really impressively named iron-rich material. Um, iron-rich material, the kind that we've been using is a brand called Ecotite, and what it is is an activated ferromanganese, and um, it's a waste product from the electric arc furnace recycling of scrap metals. And what they do is they vaporize the zinc out of metal at 1500 degrees Celsius. And so you can kind of think of it as the activated carbon process where we use steam to remove the impurities and create activated faces within uh, activated carbon and it'll pull your dissolved ions and absorb them directly onto the surface. So with IRM, our theory, uh, along with several others, it's high in uh, salts, hydroxides, which raise the pH tremendously and force precipitation reactions. We also think we're getting some adsorption reactions onto these activated iron faces and some ion exchange as we pull some of our uh, metals out and it's just swapping out for various easily dissolvable metals inside um, the IRM system. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, SAPS, SAPS, successive alkalinity producing systems. These are really just ponds in series that might use any one of these, um, just depending on what you're looking for. Are you trying to get your iron to fall out first so that you might be able to get zinc later with an IRM process? Um, and then, or yeah, it's so really it's just an engineered design to try to accommodate those problems that I was speaking to earlier in a way that we can actually handle them for a sustained period of time. DAS is very similar to SAPS. Really, all of these have a pretty common theme. This is dispersed alkaline substrate. Um, I think this has got some really interesting opportunities, applications in the San Juans. Um, we, see, we see it in Telluride, kind of, uh, just through the sedimentary rocks that we still have over the top of our um, basalts and the, the actual injection down here, the volcanic injection, where we don't see it over on the Red Mountain side, and it's because it blew the end, all the carbonates off, depositing nicely, a lot of them for Telluride is a tuff on top, and our water is coming down, we're getting our buffering coming through, all of these old limestones uh, <clears throat> deposited from the Devonian bottom of the ocean. Um, and that's what, so the earth is actually producing our buffering on the Telluride side that we don't see over on the Red Mountain side. Um, so, how are, we, how are all these working? Force precipitation of the metals by raising the pH and increasing the alkalinity, buffering, buffering. Uh, we can get our precipitates to fall out in a, and uh, you know, this could be everything. We could use a stream channel, uh, an entire stream bottom, and just, we see it in Mineral Creek even a little bit, where the water is moving through these systems and it has the opportunity to pick up that limestone, buffer itself, deal with the biology, and the, we get a little phytoremediation, the metals start coming up in the plants. Um, and <clears throat> we also have ion exchange, as I was speaking to, we have adsorption, where the metals are literally just being sponged right out of the water. Um, biological metabolisms and sequestration with those bio biological systems. Um, and then phytoremediation, which is really, uh, once you have the system fairly healthy, then we can really start talking about phyto. So what did we do here? We did, we've had a, a batch IRM test, a column IRM test, and we did a pilot IRM test here in the 2014 following the success of our batch and column tests. This is just a little schematic of what our pilot test looked like. We were coming directly out of the treasury portal um, into a collection tank. And then I was using, because the, the pH of the treasury is around five and a half to six. So a lot of our iron is already in total form, um, which is really nice. And that's kind of the low hanging fruit. And we're coming after the zinc. So 
um, using just a sand and pea gravel even to remove our TSS, our iron solids, our precipitates, our oxides, to keep our reactive media, the uh, IRM here, from plugging prematurely due to stuff that we can pull out with locally available, really cheap materials. And a lot of that, this just comes down to figuring out what can we figure use locally that's going to help us get to the point where the more special stuff will actually last longer, be more sustainable. Here's a picture of the system. Excuse my garbage can sticker. Uh, here we have, so we, I was pumping up into the head tank into a sand filter where we were getting a lot of our gross uh, iron oxide removal into a second head tank. And here's our IRM bin. I was running 200 milliliters um, a minute, half an hour retention time. So compare that to the limestones where we need 24 hours. And you'll see that the IRM, because it's working so quickly, provides us with the opportunity to have a much smaller footprint, and which is something that we can actually work with in our steep canyons to pull these metals out. <clears throat> um, here is the results of that, that particular test. We had our influence ink level around 10 milligrams per liter. Um, down here we have our pore volumes, a pore volume just being how much water will fit into that basin at one time. Um, so up here to, let's see, where's our blue? So by 700 pore volumes, we were still getting complete removal of zinc um, from 10 down to zero. And we started seeing a little bump here. And I think we started coming back down because as we, I mean, this system ran for almost two months, and we started getting some occlusion in our pumps, and my flow rate started slowing down, increasing the hydraulic retention time. Um, opening, so as the water moved through it slower, we started removing that zinc. For the system we're building this summer, um, we're targeting a two-hour hydraulic retention time. So hopefully we'll see these, uh, these zeros extend out here into the 2,000 pore volume range. This is just a little schematic of the system we're looking at building up there at the Treasury portal. Start with a standard distribution tank, three parallel cells. Each of these is designed to handle 50 gallons per minute. Um, they're in parallel, so this provides us the ability to scale it up, scalability, um, to go up to 100 gallons per minute, which we have seen out of the treasury if we want to open up two cells at once. And it also provides us redundancy. If we start to see plugging, we can start kicking into additional cells. Um, yep. Exactly. So, moving forward, uh, what, what can we do as we look at these portals that are, that are draining out? Buffering, 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 really getting that iron, that ferrous and ferric iron is our biggest, biggest enemy, biggest animal. Um, and it, limestone will do it, but it's just going to take time and it's going to take scale and it's going to take mass. Um, and then from there, oxygenation, getting that oxygen into the water. As it comes out of all these portals, usually it's pretty low. Um, how can we do that? Well, we have a lot of gradient to work with. If we have nothing, we have gradient. And uh, so cascades, bubblers, as we're bringing this water out, um, tromps is a really interesting one that actually uses the velocity of water to pull oxygen in. And it's a really simple system. You could build one for $100 and we could have compressed air uh, just bubbling into our, our drainages for essentially free. Um, continue just isolating those tailings piles. And, of course, events just like this where we're promoting the awareness, the education, and getting everybody and the motivation, hopefully, and maybe a few technical skills for uh, what exactly we're dealing with and the confidence that we, this is a problem that we can, we can totally work towards and tackle. And it's really just going to take a, a massive public effort. Um, special thanks to my colleagues at Worthington Miller, who certainly helped me all the way through from introducing the ideas of Tromps and other passive ideas for Idorado and Newmont. Their support's been absolutely incredible through all these uh, batch column, all the studies. And uh, David Levy was my, Dr. Dave, uh, my PhD, who's really helping me out with my chemistry um, and was along my, right by my side through all of these various tests. So just a special shout out to him. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the Red Mountains are a pretty unique situation, but are, have you come across in your research uh, other places in the world with this situation that have tried these abiotic uh, reactors on a much more massive scale? It's, it's one thing to do it on a small scale, but is there anybody doing this on a massive scale? 
Um, the closest might be the actual, the initial test site for the IRM, Palmerton Superfund Zinc Site in Palmerton, Pennsylvania. They built a trench that was a half mile long, um, installed it in 1978 and brought their zinc concentrations from the mid hundreds down to zero to present day. And they haven't done a dang thing. It's basically a permeable, permeable reactive barrier that they just trench all the way around their old zinc plating plant, and uh, it's, they've seen really great results in their, their groundwater. So that's probably the biggest one. Have you had any access to the Climax mine water treatment system? The Climax? Yeah, the new plant. <laughs> no, no, I, I did hear they were building a new plant up there, but I haven't gotten to check that one out yet. It'd be interesting if you can get in time. Yeah? yeah they're doing some really interesting work. I'm, no, I'm always open. <laughs> Looking for new ideas. Yes, sir. I wonder, uh, in terms of the biological side of things, uh, is, has there been any experimentation with the uh, mycoremediation? The uh, Telluride Institute happens to actually sponsor a mushroom festival. We're working with sure. individuals focused on mycoremediation. You know, mushrooms are incredible things, and I haven't really, I haven't really seen that in the mining side so much, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised to find out they could do something pretty remarkable. All right, thanks very much.